everybody seems to be confused by Apple's new $7,000 flagship computer, but it's really not confusing. Here's a one-line summary of this machine. Are you ready? The 2023 Mac Pro is an aspirational failure that may kill the Mac Pro namesake, not save it. But that might be okay. Let's start by talking about what this computer was supposed to be, because it was not this. <laughs> we have overwhelming evidence to support that. Since the unveiling of the original M1, supply chain leaks indicated that there would be two other chips in the product pipeline. We now know those as M1 Pro and M1 Max. The latter chip, M1 Max, was rumored to be of a chiplet design that would allow for an interconnect bus that could, in essence, glue two or four chips together to make a mega chip twice or four times as powerful. And the M1 Ultra, well, it became exactly that, a chip twice as powerful as the M1 Max because it was literally two M1 Maxes glued together. Apple bragged about their Ultra Fusion Interposer architecture extensively when the M1 Ultra was announced, but cheesy marketing aside, it was pretty remarkable. For comparison, CPU interconnects from AMD manage a tad over 200 gigabytes per second. Intel's Xeon lineup pre-Sapphire Rapids could barely crack 40 gigabytes per second. And even Nvidia's top of the line server tensor core GPUs could only sustain about 600 gigabytes per second over NVLink 3. In essence, Apple was claiming to be capable of greater than four times the interchip performance of anybody. This not only allowed memory to be pooled between the CPU and GPU, but that even in software, the glued dies would be recognized as a singular addressable chip with essentially no transport overhead, no degradation in performance. Part of what enabled this at an affordable price was TSMC's integrated fanout plus local silicon interconnect packaging technology. Wow, that is a mouthful. That Apple was the first and I think still the only one to really utilize at scale. In short, unlike other packaging methods, namely the popular chip on wafer on substrate design, INFO LSI can be done significantly cheaper, like significantly cheaper. And there's a bunch of other benefits like better power efficiency, as well as integration flexibility when designing for extra logic and memory modules on heterogeneous SOCs like the M series chips. But here's the problem, larger interconnect and substrate layers have lower yields the bigger that the SOC gets. And the rumored M2 Extreme, this 4X quad chip, would have been massive. Apple leaker Mark Gurman essentially suggested last year that the quest for an M2 Extreme had been canned due to increasing costs, that a Mac Pro with such a chip would retail near $10,000. That may well be true, but I think it's more likely that Apple just couldn't get dependable yields and that it wasn't worth it to move to a more expensive and entirely different packaging method for this singular SKU. I mean, 10 grand for a computer since when has Apple cared about pricing on their pro computers? Regardless of what happened though, that left us with this, a 2019 Mac Pro chassis with the same chip found in the cheaper, smaller, just plain better Mac Studio a chip without the power draw and heat output that would require such a behemoth of a case, one designed in the x86 days of yore. But while the M2 Ultra might not befit the Pro case, it sure does perform like a Pro chip should in a number of areas. Our benchmarking found a number of sizable improvements over the M1 Ultra in essentially every test, 20 to 30% improvements across the board. And while performance of the M2 Ultra is not double that of the M2 Max in every test, it is roughly 35% faster on average, holding true to the prior generation's precedent. Even in Cinebench, a benchmark that heavily favors Intel, the M2 Ultra's multi-core score hung with all but the Ryzen 7950X and latest generation Intel Core i9 processors. Not shabby at all. In real world workloads, especially those exclusive to Mac OS, the M2 Ultra does an awesome job, as should be expected. But it does have one extraordinary weakness, and that is the same weakness that every Apple Silicon chip has had, GPU chutzpah. Apple now highlights the ability to drive three 8K displays and refresh rates up to 240 hertz. Nice. 
But this is an improvement in I.O. by bringing two new 48 gigabits per second HDMI ports more than it is some revolutionary upgrade in video capability. For traditional graphics-based GPU tasks, the M2 Ultra gets clobbered by even mid-range GPUs. From gaming to 3D animation, the M2 Ultra only looks good when contrasted against prior Macs, not when taking an objective view of the market. And in compute tasks, well, stuff doesn't really much improve. It barely manages to beat out a sub $2,000 MSI laptop in Geekbench's OpenCL test. Not a great look. Now, okay, when accounting for optimized software utilizing metal compute instead of something like OpenCL, things should improve, right? Well, the M2 Ultra is still handily outpaced. Even the $750 AMD RX 6950 XT smashes it, and that's a one-year-old GPU. Not just supported by every modern PC, but even the 2019 Mac Pro that this computer is intending to replace. And that's the headline. The M2 Ultra, graphically, is less capable than a four-year-old Mac Pro. And that brings us to the PCIe slots, which cannot support GPUs. Subsequently, gone are the eight-lane MPX slots for Apple's Fancy Pants graphics cards that supported Thunderbolt pass-through. And gone is the PLX PCIe switch on the reverse side of the motherboard. This was one of the coolest things about the 2019 Mac Pro. Because despite the Cascade Lake Xeons only supporting 64 PCIe lanes, that PLX chip in the prior Mac Pro allowed you to install eight full-size cards using up to 96 lanes. The lack of MPX this time around makes the new Mac Pro's motherboard look barren. <laughs> but so do the lacking lane traces, because there are just two X16 slots, just four X8 slots, and one X4 slot. We've got ourselves much skimpier I.O this time around. But without support for GPUs, I mean, does it really even matter? What can you even put in here? Well, we tested PCIe-based storage devices and network interface cards that both worked pretty much without a hitch. As long as the device is supported by macOS, it is supported here. But that didn't really seem to me like something that a pro would actually require. So I talked to a few pros. And while writing this video, I really found out that there's only two real potential markets for this new Mac Pro, and that's live production houses and musicians. Now, multi-stream video capture cards are crucial on set, in studio, and more. However, many of the latest offerings from brands are moving to Thunderbolt anyways, not because such a Mac doesn't exist, but because there are features that are not afforded by an add-in board that you can utilize with Thunderbolt, like displays, external cases, and more. And in the music world, pros I talked to, well, they told me that really only Pro Tools still makes use of PCIe-based HDX cards for processing. Every other major DAW has moved to primarily supporting Thunderbolt interfaces years ago. One engineer told me that even within the Avid Pro Tools community, most musicians are now exclusively using Thunderbolt-based HDXs, DSPs, and FPGAs from brands like Antelope and others anyways. So if the Mac Pro isn't for the weirdos that it's alleged to be for, is it for anyone? Why release it at all? I think people are trying to solve some great mystery that's not actually a mystery at all. The Mac Pro we have today was not originally the plan. It became a machine marked with technical follies and delays and was ultimately released with compromise. And maybe that's going to make this machine the last Mac Pro. But I think it's more than likely there's just a stopgap in between figuring out a more ideal solution. Look, throughout the entire 2010s, Apple neglected its pro market, a market that just wanted something, but instead got nothing. Today, we have two great pro-level options. Okay, sure, they're very similar. And in the process of releasing a machine without class-leading graphics, well, they've basically destroyed any remaining hope of refuge for 3D artists, animators, architects, and weirdos that need a GPU. But transparent disappointment is better than obfuscated neglect. And if there's anything that Apple has proven over the last decade, there's always the possibility that they will change course when it comes to the Mac. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, stay snazzy.